All right, we're back talking thoroughbred horse racing on Horsepower PSN. I'm your host, Greg De Palma. Joining me, of course, each week, John Hardoon from The Sheets. How's it going, John? Very good. How are you? I'm doing good. And good. coming to us live from Dubai. He's back in Dubai. He's making me dizzy. Chad Summers, professional horse trainer. How's it going, Chad? It's good. Got nine days, uh, tick, nine tick, days tick. to go. We're breezing, uh, breezing tomorrow with Senior Buscador. Together, we've earned more than $10 million this year. Yeah. Keep it fancy company these days. <laughs> yeah. And uh, who else is running next week? Because we're going to be talking. So we're talking about so it's nine days. So, wow. So next week's show. Are you going to be uh, able to handle next week's show, Chad? We're going to try. We'll give it a try. <laughs> yeah, because next week's a big week. Next week, we really got start kicking in. Yeah, uh, you have the, isn't it the Florida, uh, yep. Florida, Der Florida Derby next week? And, and the Oakland, uh, the, Arkansas, uh, the Arkansas, Derby. Arkansas Derby has moved up a week now, too. So And Chad's race. So we're loaded next week. Absolutely. And the UAE Derby, which is a 100-point race for some reason. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so we have a lot to go over next week. That's going to be awesome. By the way, on, on uh, last week's show, uh, Chad hit it uh, with a Rocket Can. Rocket Can race number 10. Uh, what was that race? Was that... Uh, what race was that, that? Was, race? that was the race after the uh, Whitmore. Whitmore, yeah. Okay, and then Which was uh, scratched down to a five-horse field, by the way. So we can't do anything about that when you have those late scratches. Right? Yes, the Whitmore was down to a five-horse. Uh, at, at least I, I hit the exacta, so I was happy about that. And it was good that Jackson Traveler won. I know one thing. That there's, there's, there's a race every year when you say, "Man, Flavian Pratt might be the best jockey in the world." Uh, last year it was the uh, the race in Santa Anita that he won the Grade One on the Mole Ray for Brad Cox. The ride he gave to Rivet in the Whitmore last last he week. He wasn't on Rivet. He oh, was Jackson on Traveler. Jackson, I'm Jackson Traveler. Traveler. If if anybody else rides that horse, I don't think Jackson Traveler wins the race. He he gave him the most perfect ride yeah. you'll ever see. Yep. He's great. And he had good odds too, so that worked out. Okay, right, so what we're going to do uh, is, uh, first of all, talk about the two races at fairgrounds, uh, including, of course, the big one, the Louisiana Derby. So we're going to do races 11 and 12. After that, we're going to say goodbye to John, and then we're going to talk about a couple of races, including the Jeff Ruby Stakes. And one of our uh, Patreon uh, members has a race that he would like us to talk about, and that is the Bourbonette at Turfway. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but let's get started with race number 11, the Fairgrounds Oaks. This is a hundred points for the Phillies, right, Chad? I believe so. Yeah. Big, uh, big three-year-old Philly race. And I mean, the winner of the winner of the Kentucky Oaks last year came from this race. Yeah. Okay. This is a mile and a 16th purse, 400,000 should go off about 10 after six. So, taking a look at the uh, favorite, the morning line favorites, you've got Intricate at two to one. That's the six. Uh, the uh, five, eight to five shot, Tarifa. Speaking of Flavian Pratt, uh, and then you also have a top money line uh, uh, contender, morning line contender, four to one shot, our pretty woman. That's five, six, and seven. So let's and start just, with uh, some house, just some housekeeping things in this race. I, I believe. You believe you uh, and run at Turfway Park. Say again? You froze. Joe. Alpine Princess is going to scratch here and run at Turfway Park. Oh. Okay. And uh, the bottom horse, Dallas Stewart, to accommodate Eva, is cross-centered on the uh, on the card. Not sure yet what they're going to do. Okay. Uh, that's the eight. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Still unsure. So this might actually end up as a six-horse field. Yes. Okay. It is what it is. And but and so Alpine Princess is that going to any of the, hor the races we're going to talk about? Yeah, we'll talk about it after John goes off the air on the Bourbonette. Uh, okay. Turquoise. All right. So let's then talk about. Well, the three favorites uh, are uh, still here. Let's uh, start with the two to one shot. Intricate. Uh, the 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 line is really strong. John twenty one eighteen fourteen last year begins this year with a thirteen. Keeps getting better each uh, race with the sheets. Um, finished second in the grade two in February at Fairgrounds. She's fine. There's nothing wrong with her, but uh, I'm going in a different direction. Both her and Tarifa have very similar lines off the sheets. They both continue to improve with each start. 
You know, one ran uh, 14-13, the other one ran 14-13. You know, they're okay, but you're not going to bet uh, that exacto will be paying four bucks. You know, you don't want a five six six five exacto. You got to find something a little more interesting in here, and I think I did. So when you get to my horse, I'll let you know. Look, I think that the the, the question is really this. Look, there's no doubt Tarifa was the better horse when she squared off with Intergrit last time out. Now, was she the better horse because there were some scratches in the race? It was a sloppy track. She really seemed to handle the sloppy track. Tarifa's also been running consistently. She's run four months in a row. She's in October, November, January, February. She's been she's been running consistently where an intricate was coming off the layoff. I think we've seen what Tarifa is. I know she, her numbers have gone up, but I would expect more than likely she pairs here or regresses a bit where I think Intricate can move forward, making her second start of the year. So between the two, if you're going to play an exact or something like that, I prefer Intricate over Tarifa. And I, I, I think Intricate is definitely the horse to beat with some marked improvement, making her second start. Look, they've known all along, and Brandon certainly knows how to win the Kentucky Oaks. He did it last year. So this is their Oaks filly. They're following that path a little bit differently uh, than the filly from last year. But – she got her a little freshening after she was more accomplished uh, as a two-year-old than than the filly from last year, Purdue Shibia. So I think that she's coming into this race the right way, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing Intricate's performance here. I'm going to go with Intricate as my top pick, and I do think that she turns the table on Tarifa, and let, I'm interested to see who who you like here. I love a horse here. Oh, and John loves a horse. The reason I love the horse is only on the condition that the track comes up fast because there's a chance of rain uh, later today and all day Friday. So I'm giving a horse that I love based on it being a fast racetrack. If you look at Vivi's Dream, the one horse, her last two races were terrible, but there was a reason. Both of those races were run on a sloppy track. If you go back to her two-year-old races, look at her sheet, how pretty it was. She worked her way down, I think, to an eleven. And uh, no one else had an 11 back in uh, October. No one else had a 13 back in September, which this horse ran. I know she's out of Metoli, and this may be a little far, but that 11, she has three races back. The last time she was on a fast track was, you know, um, was this distance. So I'm going, and, I, and I'm getting eight to one. You know, I have the rail. McPeak certainly knows how to win these races, and I like this horse in this spot a lot. If the track is fast, for me, it's the chicken or the egg, though. I mean, this—I I agree with you. Her two-year-old form was lights out, but she and doesn't have legitimate excuses. Both of her last two races were on sloppy racetracks. She co- went co- three to one against these same horses last time co- out. Correct. However, my thing is, I don't know that she's improved from two to three, and. If you're right, you're going to be paid for it. I'm not going to try and, you know, I'm not going to tell you, hey, at eight to one, you know, don't, you're, you know, you're crazy because you're right. I mean, the, the, the slop is a slop. I, I'm playing that she needs to show it to me. So okay. I'm going to sit out. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't go to the, I didn't go to the wedding. I'm not going to the funeral. Uh, if you want to keep her by all means, but I'm, 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 I'm tossing her. If she beats me, she beats me. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, if, if, she had just run those four races. If she would be the favorite or one of the favorites in the race, oh, based I, on that no line, doubt. there's no doubt. But she's she's run twice now, um, since then. Yeah, and she's been she's been bad. And, but and look, does have excuse. Both of those races were on a slot. Listen, anyone could pick a horse. Everybody looks at what a horse did last time at. This is how you find value. I'm just t- giving you, you know, not you, Chad per se, but people that are listening. You, when, when you My concern, find excuses, that's how you get value in a race. And the horse has legitimate excuses. Both of those. They were, offered, they were offered a lot of money. They were offered a lot of money for this filly after she won the Pocahontas. And they stood their ground and turned it down. And, and Kenny McPeak and his family, Magdalena Racing, own half this horse. Okay. Um, they didn't pay a lot of money for, relatively speaking, 190000 That's, that's a, a lot of salary, year salaries for many people. But in horse racing, it's not it's not an astronomical fee. Um, they stood the pat. They didn't sell. Um, after the Alcibiades, they could have gone to the Breeders' Cup. They were talking about the Breeders' Cup. They ended up staying home. They didn't want to go to California. I just, for me, it, there's there's just so many. There's just too many questions. Look, the last breeze looks really good on paper, 59-3. and three. I wish we could see a video of it. Uh, she's worked regularly since the last race. I like the three-work pattern in between the Rachel Alexander's, indicating that she's certainly healthy 
uh, and moving forward and is training like a good horse. I just don't know how far she wants to go and if she's moved up from two to three. But at eight to one, I'm not going to take it. I'm that. getting paid for my invention. And correct, I, correct. I think I built somewhat of a decent case. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Not saying- I don't know, 100%. 100%. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, hope that those odds stay at eight to one, and they should. Because we have three others and a very short. Well, field. it'll drop a little bit with with the scratch yeah, of Alpine know. Princess. Yeah, with the scratch of Alpine it's Princess. Five to one top. Yeah, I don't think you yeah, get more than five yeah. to one. Uh, the other uh, top uh, contender on the morning line is our pretty woman, a four to one shot. Asmussen Rosario combo, 17 first time out, broker maiden right away, came back with an impressive 13 last time out. So uh, this horse has done nothing wrong. Two for two, both also at fairgrounds, and, and the last race was also track. at this distance. Both on sloppy tracks. And track. both were on sloppy tracks. Uh, so she's, that looking, is... she's, she's, she's doing the opposite of what John. John's doing <laughs> yeah. no rain. She's doing a rain dance. <laughs> yeah. So, Listen, she may be better on fast, but we, we don't, don't know. know. Exactly, but I'm not going to find they out. They paid big money for her. Well, what but else? The thing, look, she's a $900,000 purchase. The, the thing that's interesting about her is, yes – Obviously, we've never seen her on a fast track before, but she she's she's lucking out here with the scratches because um, Brad's horse had was the other kind of predominant speed in the race with Alpine Princess and accommodate Eva on the outside. Even though I don't think she can win, um, she she's kind of been outclassed in in these open company races. She's okay, Louisiana bred. She has a little bit of speed. If she scratches as well, our pretty woman can find herself on an uncontested lead early on and and joel rosario as much as everybody talks about how good he is coming from behind um when he's in front he's very tough to pass um and that would be the one thing with our pretty woman is if if these horses do scratch and it's a six horse field and rosario's walking the dog in front she could certainly get brave even if these other horses are a little bit better than her you know it could just kind of the track could work take out for her from a trip yeah. standpoint exactly i agree with that too all right. And then the other horses in the field, you've got the two coming off of 17. You have the four coming off of 14. And then we talked about the eight who might scratch coming off an 11. But that was a new top by eight points. So um, a bounce is probably expected anyway from Accommodate Ava. What about those three? Any Anything on those three? I don't think so. I, you know, you can't use One thing I'll say and it's completely irrelevant, but uh, the aid accommodate Eva was bred in part by Todd Fincher, who was the trainer of Senior Buscador. I have no idea how he ended up breeding this horse, but in the world is his oyster right now. He won a $20 million race. Maybe he's going to be the breeder of the year in Louisiana if accommodate Eva can get stakes placed in this race. Uh, look, other than that, I think uh, Midsummer March and Lucy got game. I think they're both in this race, knowing that it's a small field, trying to get some black type, what it means to their pedigrees in the future. I don't think either of them are winning. Okay, let's go with the picks. John, one and? One with five, six in exact. It's first and second. Viva's Dream with the five Tarifa and the six intricate. One, five, one, six, reverse them. All right. Chad, you're going with the six? Yeah, I'll take intricate on top. The only thing I would play in this race is I would play an exact box light uh, with our pretty woman just in case the, the, the race kind of went the way that it possibly could. I'd, I'd play with her a little bit on top of the six and then heavier with the six on top of the seven. I, I'm just, I, I need Vivi's dream to prove it to me and I'm not as big a fan of Tarifa as many others. So that's the way I look at it. So that's six. Greg, you're up. So that was six over one. No, six, seven. Six over seven. Six, six over seven. seven. I'm going to do a seven. That'll be my top choice over one and two. So those hey. will be my picks for the Florida, the fairgrounds, uh, excuse me, fairgrounds Oaks. Uh, race number 11 at Fairgrounds. So let's talk about the big race, the Louisiana Derby. So this is uh, pretty much the, you know when the Louisiana Derby hits, it's Kentucky Derby prep time. And the Louisiana Derby is a mile and three sixteenths. That's the race there with a post time of about quarter to seven. And we'll take a look at the morning line here uh, as far as the uh, the favorites. And this is a lot of, we got 12 horses and the favorite is the 12th horse that's our boy track phantom who we've talked a lot about on this program at three to one from the 12th post position you also have four to you also have a four to one shot catching freedom that's the five cox and pratt uh going at it again um and then uh really you go to the you go to the five is that five or six to one six to one shot common defense the 10 so uh it's a big race there's 
potential look should, should be good money to be made here because there's not a lot of uh, low numbers as far as the odds are concerned so let's start with the 12 track phantom even though his sheets don't look all that impressive or at least the last race wasn't that all impressive with the 15 um what do you think about the track phantom in this race john well, I don't think uh, he's getting better. That's his problem. You know, he made a backward move last time out. That was maybe because of the slop. If you want to excuse it, you certainly can. But last year, he did have an 11 at fairgrounds at the end of this the year. This year, the best he's done is a 13. I think he's outposted. He's going to have to use his speed. Listen, obviously, he can cross over. But he's going to be the favorite. I think he's vulnerable. I would use him with the horse that I'm playing because the horse that I like is a price. But I'm not keying off of him. And he shouldn't have any problems, Chad, uh, getting to the lead right away. I mean, though, the problem the problem is going to be that Todd Pletcher and, and just a little house scheming on this race as well. Um, so Todd Pletcher entered three, will run two. OK, uh, the one horse triple espresso will go to Turfway for the Jeff Ruby stakes. OK, um, but Antiquarian and a gate road will run. They're different ownership groups. But I will tell you this. Uh, a gate road is there's no bonds about it. it's going to come from behind and the antiquarium is going to be forwardly placed so with track phantom coming over yes but i think antiquarium is going to hold this position i think it puts track phantom um in a stalking position I, especially with with knowing joel rosario never in a rush to really push a horse over there and it's a mile and three sixteenths race i i can see the two of them just kind of hooking up early on not setting crazy fractions but setting realistic fractions 23 47 uh, something along those lines. I don't think he clears. I don't think he's necessarily a faster horse than Antiquarian. To be honest with you, they both ran the same day last time, albeit Antiquarian was in a maiden race and Track Phantom was in the was in the was in the prep race. But to me, they ran almost similar times. Antiquarian maybe a tick faster uh, overall. They uh, neither of them went very fast at the end of the day. Um, I don't think either of them can win the Derby. But as far as this individual race is concerned. Um, look, Track Phantom needs to get better. John John hit the nail on the head. I mean, he he he's he's shown glimpses, and we want it, it's it's so funny when we talk about Triple Crown races. You look, we spend half the half the year or, or four months of the year talking about Derby preps, and then the other part of the year is, is you know every other race and and everything else. When we talk about Derby races, we always want to give a pass to certain trainers: Bob Baffert, Todd Pletcher. Um, Steve Asmussen, Brad Cox, they've earned it, right? They've won the majority of these races. So time in and time out, we're very quick to just say, that's an Asmussen horse. He's He's been there before, epicenter, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. He, he knows how to get a good horse to the race. He prepares them. He knows how to get them to see out the distance. They've been on this circuit. They've been on this plan. At the end of the day, this horse might not be good enough. He might be more red route one than epicenter, even though they have different running styles. And you have to look at that with 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 open eyes. You can't just have kind of a, a glass pane just saying, "Oh, it's it's Steve Asmussen. He'll figure it out." And and at three to one as the favorite, I think he's a vulnerable favorite. I agree with John. I think he's a vulnerable favorite. Yeah, well, his last three sheet numbers have gone 11, 13, 15. That's not the direction you want to see uh, at this time of year. So we'll see if he can gain momentum back again. A gate road. You mentioned a gate road. So that's the four, the eight to one shot. Now, as you also mentioned, he's a closer. So we all know what happened to track phantom with Sierra Leone passing him late, uh, and, and using the closer form to beat him. So a gate road coming off a nine, uh, in a runner up finish, uh, in that race at Tampa, uh, the grade three race at Tampa, John. So a nine, uh, looking at this uh, field, that's the best I think that we've seen out of any horse so far here. If you think he's going to run off the nine. If you remember last time out, he ran in the Sam F. Davis where we liked the winner, but I hated this horse. He was a Pletcher horse. He was trying dirt, I think, for the first time. He shocked me. He ran a, re a really good race, you know, and uh, I don't know. The whole question with him is if he's going to repeat that race. I think he's more likely to react off of it. That being said, at least he's 8 to 1. So for that reason, he ran the last fastest number and he's a price. I would use him. I wouldn't key off of him, though, but I would use him. So Pletcher won this race last year with Kingsbarn walking the dog in front. I think they went the half and 51 and change, if we remember correctly, because Florent Giroux said he went too fast. He couldn't catch him when he was sitting second. <laughs> um, but regardless, I digress. Uh, look, a gate road is, uh, for me, 
I understand he's run on the dirt. He, he ran on the dirt. He rained off the turf first time out. He did run second. Uh, the reason why they ran him on the grass is because his mother, Yellow Gate, uh, was a greatest day course for Christoph Clement on the grass. I get it. But for for me, that, that Sam F. Davis was a suspect race with a suspect field. It wasn't necessarily flattered. I know No More Time came back and probably should have won the Tampa Bay Derby, which might have been, I think, we, we finally got the number from that race. That, that race was a ridiculously slow number, and both horses that were 1-2 in the Tampa Bay Derby are saying that they're not going to run again to the Kentucky Derby. So it seems like now the new plan is um, we just don't want to be exposed anymore. We just want to be in the dance. We don't want actually want to win the race. We just want to, we just want to, uh, you know, bring over our derby hats. We want to participate. We just want to participate. You know, we'll get our participation pins. It's going to be the easiest derby ever to handicap because there's going to be 12 horses that have no shot the way that these horses are being prepared into this race. Uh, look, I think uh, a gate road needs to take the step forward. I think he wasn't going to be a factor knowing that there wasn't a lot of pace in the Tampa Bay Derby. They made the right decision not running in there. Um, I probably selfishly would have run him in the bourbon net and, and the, uh, and the Jeff Ruby stakes kept him on the grass, oh. um, or, or the poly track, whatever, you know, the, the battle of less evils, but look, I applaud them for trying this race. And, and like John said at eight to one, if you like him, you're, you're going to be rewarded, but he's in the same camp as Vivi's dream with me. I, I, I need, I need him to prove it to me before I'm going to back him. I, I, I like other horses at prices, uh, more than I like a gate road. Yeah, Gate Road definitely becomes an, an instant uh, Derby contender if that if he wins and sure. comes in with an eight or a seven. He's not coming in with an eight or seven off of the nine. There's no way he's running. It. No way. <laughs> I've looked at a million sheets. I don't see an eight or seven come. Who All right. Uh, Honor Marie um, might be the interesting horse because John just talked about uh, this uh it's the same kind of situation here if you look at it. Last year, exactly. 16, exactly. 12, 11. And then this year, John, uh, it's obvious, you know, he has the bad race on slop. It's exactly the same situation. I mean, if it rains Saturday, take all my selections and throw them in the garbage. But uh, <laughs> horse has an 11 as a two-year-old going long at Churchill. Uh, he never did anything wrong. He came out, he ran a bad race last time out. But again, I got to draw a line through it. It was on a sloppy track. He goes back to that 11 that he has as a two-year-old, and no one's going to touch him. If you really get anywhere near 8-1, to one, a run to the window. It's been a while since I've said this, um, but when we're, we connect, we connect, John. I agree with you. Adam Murray's going to be my top selection as well. Um, look, trainer Whit Beckman, a longtime assistant for Todd Fletcher and Chad Brown, is a very underrated trainer. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to get one ready. And, and that last race, aside from being a sloppy track, was was just a prep race. Okay, and he moves forward. He has the three works since the race. On this has always been their plan is to get to the Louisiana Derby to get back home to to Churchill Downs. Um, I agree. I, I didn't think that Bayerano gave his best ride last time in the Ridden Star, whether he was ready or not, whether it was sloppy track or not. Um, I don't know Ben Curtis, but I mean, he seemed like he's doing okay this year. Uh, he's probably been working the horse in the morning time. The horse wasn't working lights out uh, going into the last race. He was actually getting outworked by an unraced horse named Drip, who actually ended up uh, winning first time out impressively uh, on the undercard of the Risen Star, and, and is is a contender now for like a race like the Pat Day Mile and things like that. Uh, he's moved forward since then. His work since then, I like this. I like the series. I like the big work. Two works back, going five eighths in a minute showing that he's he's taking signs in the right direction. He's a horse where he came to fairgrounds for a reason. Whit Beckman had the option to stay in Kentucky or, or prepare this horse wherever he wanted to. This is obviously when you're a small up-and-coming trainer, every decision you make, whether you want to believe it or not, is based on your best horse. Because you don't have the capability at Kentucky, that's you're going to have strings in four places. So you're going to say, this is my best horse, Honor Marie. Where is the thing that gives me the best opportunity to expose the horse and myself to the best opportunities to move forward? The goal with Honor Marie is to go to the Kentucky Derby. He said, look, this is a horse that wants to run all day. What is the series that allows my horse to continue moving forward? Not the New York circuit mile and eighth mile, mile and eighth mile. Not the short stretch at Oak Lawn. Not, not Derby, not Gulfstream. He says, go to, go to fairgrounds. So you run a mile and an eighth off the bench. Even if he's not ready, you got a lot out of it. Now you're going a mile and three sixteenths into then a mile and a quarter. I love this move by Whit Beckman. I think this horse is going to be very, very tough to beat, and I love the 8-1. to one. So I'm, well, I'm, with John. I'm all in on, on Anna Marie here. A match. 
Question, uh, John. Hall of Fame, the number two eight to one shot. Uh, starts with an 18, comes back with a very strong 12 at fairgrounds, breaks the maiden. The next race, which happens to be the same race we've been talking about on the slop, the Risen Star, bounces, though, to a 19. So the question is, can we look at this almost two ways where, okay, it was sloppy, he was going to bounce anyway, now he's coming off the 12, heading back forward, should this be a horse that maybe is a pretty decent play on Saturday? The problem with this horse is that the 12 was when he went on Lasix, so it may have been a Lasix pop. Okay. And he doesn't have the foundation as a two-year-old. His two-year-old race was an 18, where Anna Marie has an 11 as a two-year-old. So when you run an 11 as a two-year-old, he's eligible to run a seven or eight on Saturday. With Hall of Fame, while we know he's making a forward move, he's not going to go that far forward. The, the interesting thing with Hall of Fame, he was my top selection in the Risen Star, and he disappointed. And maybe he didn't like the sloppy track, but he looked like he wasn't ready for the moment. He looked like he was very, very green, uh, a little bit intimidated. It was a big field, 12-horse field. He kind of ended up in no man's land. I thought he would be a little bit more forwardly placed with Ricardo Santana. And they had said after the race that they were going to go and look for another spot, and now they end up here. And, and that was, to me, the interesting thing. Like, why not just – take this horse to Oakland or, or wait for Keeneland or go, go somewhere else. I, I also know that Steve Asperson is very much a creature of habit. His horses, they always work, you know, kind of close to the race. This horse's last work was March 11th, um, where if you look down and you see the last work for track phantom was March 16th. It's a, it's an interesting work pattern. It screams to me like maybe this was not the intended target. Maybe Coolmore is, is pushing this. I know they pushed him into the risen star last time. Um, you know, maybe Kumar just wants to keep kind of chasing the, the derby. Um, the horse we talked about before, the, the son of Justify that we said might be the best horse in the, you know, two-year-old in the, in the world last year, Afraid O'Brien, they're talking about running him in the Travers already. So uh, Kumar is anxious to try and get these dirt, you know, graded stakes races. This is a grade two, but it's a Louisiana derby. It's a stallion making race. Uh, I just feel like maybe this is more of a look ahead to the future than the horse is taking us here. Yeah, we, and, and we need a lot more than eight to one. Uh, based on some of the other horses in this field. And, and let's talk about common defense, the 10. Six to one shot, uh, coming off a 13 last time out. Uh, that was his best race. Uh, that was a runner-up in the Rebel. Uh, that was a five-point top. So we might be in a bounce situation. What about common defense, John? Well, like you said, it's, it was a big top. He had one race as a two-year-old. He's he's got four races in his life. You know, he does, even if he runs a thirteen that he ran last time, he doesn't have to win. There are better options at longer prices. I like Common Defense. I liked him a lot last time. He was one of my picks underneath in the Rebel, and he ran a really, really good second. I thought he ran sneaky good in the Southwest. My concern with Common Defense is: is he in this race because he doesn't want to run his two best three-year-olds against each other, Kenny McPeak? And he has Mystic Dan waiting for the for the Arkansas Derby next week. And, you know, it made sense after running second in the Rebel, you would just wait the extra week. He's run all of his races at Oakland. He likes that track. Stay there. Instead, he comes back quick. He came back from January 13th to February 3rd, so back quick in the maiden race to the Southwest. Then he's back again in three weeks to the Rebel. Now he's back again a little bit quick here in this race. In the interim, uh, he breezed last weekend in 59-3. and three. I mean, they're, they're really putting the screws on this horse. If he were to win, could he win? Yeah, maybe it's possible, um, but he's going to be a tired sucker after this race. I, I just think they're they're pushing up, they're pushing them kind of hard. Um, I would have liked them one extra week and waited for the for the Arkansas Derby. I'm going to play against him here, thinking that he's going to bounce a little bit off that big race, uh, and I like another horse a little bit more than him. So All he's right. he's a horse that I really like. I just don't like the move. Uh, two horses uh, that are coming into their third start and running very similar sheet numbers are uh, the number three, Antiquarian, the 12-to-1 shot, two 15s, and the 11, Tuscan Gold, to the 8-to-1 shot, running a 15 and then a 14. So what about either one of those two, uh, John? I don't really like them. I mean, Chad Brown's been trying this move, uh, breaking a maiden and putting these horses into stake races. And originally I thought that was, well, if, if Chad Brown is thinking – that these horses belong in stake races, who am I to argue with them? And I've been playing them. So I'm jumping off the bandwagon today, and I don't like Tustin Gold because he broke his maiden last time out. 
and he's throwing him to the wolves, I think he's got to improve some more. And the same thing goes for an aquarium. Uh, I know it's Pletcher. Only makes his third start today, but I, I just think there are better options. John. John. John, yes. my boy. John, my boy. Go ahead, Chad. I love you with Anna with on Marie. I don't want you to blow the exacta here. Listen up and listen up close. <laughs> Tuscan Gold will probably run second. He's okay. a really, really nice horse, okay? Visually, if you watch his last race, it's better than the numbers might indicate. Um, he was as impressive a winner at Gulfstream. And there's been some good Gulfstream Park maiden winners uh, so far. He was as good a winner as there's been all me. Okay. He blew the doors off the field. And Tyler Gaffleon never really moved on him. I loved I him like last the, time. I did I love like him. the fact that Sierra Leone is going to the bluegrass. And Chad Brown says, hey, Fairground's good to me now. He's my new home. Um, so they bring Tuscan Gold. This has been their plan with this horse all along. Tyler Gaffleon had a shot to ride Hall of Fame. He rides Tuscan Gold instead. Obviously had a lot of success with Chad Brown so far this year. Um, that that race where he ran first time out, I thought he kind of needed the race a little bit. It was it was Breeders' Cup Day. I, I just think this horse has a promising future, and I think that uh, we haven't seen the best of him yet. I think he, he can continue to improve. I think he will continue to improve. And I, I'd rather take a horse – on the up, like Tuscan Gold, even though he doesn't have that that experience you talk about, John, I would I still prefer a horse like Tuscan Gold over Track Phantom. Okay, um, when you talk about Antiquarium, this is an interesting horse, uh, owned by Centennial Farms, who forever had the horses with Jimmy Jerkins. Jimmy went to to Saudi Arabia; they gave all their horses to Todd Fletcher. This was this was their horse. This was the horse they were the most high on. I thought he was going to sprint first time out, and instead they entered him in the mile race. And if you look at who he got beat by, he got beat by Conquest Warrior. Conquest Warrior came back. Uh, for Shug McGay, he won the allowance race. He's going to be one of the favorites in the Florida Derby now. So there was no no foul in running a really, really good second to him first time out. He goes to fairgrounds last time with this race in mind, breaks his maiden, does it the right way, uh, beating a really well-regarded horse for Brad Cox and Cornishman, who's came back since and broke his maiden. Uh, I know he's light on experience. I don't know, ultimately, my one concern with, with his pedigree is if he wants to go a mile and three sixteenths at this point in his career. I would have preferred him going a mile and an eighth in one of these other prep races. Um, that would be my, my one concern. And also um, the way that the race sets up, he's going to have to, he's never really going to get a breather. He's going to have to do it all um, from start to finish to go a distance. He hasn't gone yet. So that's my concern to end aquarium, but he's a horse that certainly um, I expect him to make news, you know, kind of down the road. Uh, he he'll be my early pick to win the Jim Dandy Stakes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, where do you where do you think Tuscan Gold is going to do when Track Phantom takes off? Is he going to just kind of follow behind him? No, yeah. He's a I mean, he'll he'll, he'll be mid pack. He'll he'll be he'll, yeah, he'll work out he'll work out it he'll work out it. Track of Phantom has one way to go, and that's down the road. So. All right, and then uh, the rest of the field, uh, any other the horses? Because most of them, the other uh, horses in this field, uh, well, you do have Catching Freedom. We haven't talked about Catching Freedom. That's a four-to-one shot uh, running 15-14, 14-15 at four-to-one, okay. John. If you want a price horse, I would take a very serious look at a horse named uh, – I guess you don't Real want to talk about Catching Freedom. No, Real Men Violent. Because this is another horse. As a two-year-old, he did nothing wrong. Every race was better than the previous one. 17, 15, 14, throwing out the grass. Then he comes back, and he ran in the slop. I'm just saying. He ran Are well. you trying to get Kenny McPeak to be a Patreon member? Is that what you're trying oh. today with VV, <laughs> VV's dream and Real Man Violin? I didn't even realize it. <laughs> I'm just giving you a, a horse that will be 40 to 1 that belongs maybe somewhere in the body. I just feel, I just feel like he's in the same boat as VV's dream. He's just yeah. – he was a good two-year-old, and he, he he has to show that he has to move forward as a three-year-old. Look, you're going to be rewarded on both of them if you're right. I just I I I need to see that they. No, I want to be on a Maria right in this race. That's what I want to be. I want to be on a Marie right. That's the horse I like clearly the best. Uh, Chad, anything on Catching Freedom? Look, Catching Freedom ran a good race last time. There's no he was he was he was at the top of the stretch. It looked like he had a shot to win, actually. He was in a good position. The thing that interests me, and, and I know Brad Cox is a big fan of Flavian Pratt, but the fact that Luis Saez ends up at Turfway Park on Saturday and not back here on Catching Freedom, they were back and forth on what they were going to do. Um, 
you know, thinking about running the Arkansas Derby or coming here or where they ended up, they ended up in this spot, which ends up not being the strongest running of the Louisiana Derby. Um, he's not a sexy, flashy horse in the morning time. He, he, he's shown up in the afternoon a few times, but I prefer a horse with a little bit more pizzazz. I'm not the biggest fan of this horse, even though he ran, he did run well last time. I just prefer some of these up-and-comers uh, a little bit more. And even though he finished ahead of um, – Honor Marie last time. I think Honor Marie's going to ultimately be the better horse. John, who are you going with? I'm going with the seven. Honor Marie exact is with uh, the five, uh, Chasing Freedom, the nine, Real Men Violin, and I'm going to use Chad's 11, Tuscan Gold, out of respect to Chad. Seven with five, nine, 11, and flip them. Chad, you're going with the seven as well. I'll go seven with 11 and then I'll play the 10 a little bit in common defense. I, I will say this though. Okay. For, for those people following along at home, awesome root of the six horse. Okay. This won't be mentioned. He was 223 to one when he ran last time oh. and he beat half the field. He finished six. So I'm very proud of him. He comes back here today. He's only 30 to one morning line. Maybe we get him at 112 to one this time and maybe he can finish fifth, but hey, to beat half the field, I've never, I've never in my life seen a horse go off at 223 to one. As this horse went off last time, John. John, I, I know you played races for a long time. Have you ever seen two? And by the way, two hundred twenty-three point five. It wasn't just two hundred twenty-three. Right, you, you, you got the you got the max chain. You got that nickel. You got that chain. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know that they had anything over ninety-nine to one. I, I've never. I've never seen that before. <laughs> they do. They put usually ninety-nine to one, and they don't. Well, this is unusual. But go ahead. Interesting. Sure, was in twenty-three to one. Uh, and uh, my picks, I'm going to do 12. I'm going to stick with Track Phantom over 7-11. So I'm going to put uh, the 7, the 11 in there with you boys and uh, uh, stick though with Track Phantom as the winner. And that is going to wrap it up as far as the fairgrounds. John is getting out of here. He wants nothing hey, to do with Turfway. Uh, <laughs> That's for Chad. He's the expert of Turfway. And next week's going to be a big one, John. So, yeah, we'll be loaded, ready to go. Yep. All right, guys. Stay Thank safe you. Well. Thank you. All right. So uh, be safe. All right. So let's now move on to Chad keeps uh, popping in and out. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about uh, the Turfway Park races. And we promised we were also going to, because um, originally it was all about the Jeff Ruby stakes, which again, we're going to talk about. But we also want to bring in uh, one of the other races based on one of our uh, Patreon members, uh, Singa Mendoza. He says, hi, gentlemen. Thanks again for all your great work. Two questions. One, would it be possible to give some thoughts this week on the Bourbonettes, uh, the Bourbonette Oaks? The top three in the market all have a severe six-pound penalty, and some bigger prices are very intriguing. In particular, Saratoga Secret and Trial. Any thoughts so here, on those two and the race the in general? Here, here's here's the thing. In, so in we'll start with the Barber Europe, Rod Oaks, Chad. In, can you hear me? Greg, you hear me? Hello? And unfortunately, I'm losing Chad here. Bad timing. I don't have a partner to talk to. There he is. Can you hear me now? Now I can, can hear you. Hear you. Go ahead, okay. Chad. All right. so let's Look, the thing about the race that's that's interesting. In Europe, they make a huge deal about weight. And they feel like weight is a great equalizer. In America, we don't. Uh, Bobby Franco, Hall of Fame trainer Bobby Franco, was a huge proponent on weight. He would cry and complain to stakes coordinators until they try to give him the, the least weight possible. Um, I don't know that it's as big a deal. Um, I've, I haven't seen it as, as closely. Uh, Saratoga Secret is an interesting horse. Um, she's never tried um, this service before. She cost um, quite a bit of money at the sale. She was a $200,000 yearling uh, at Phasic Tipton. She coming off a really poor effort in, in Oakland last time out. She was good in Ellis, but she, she hasn't really duplicated that form. And I think people always want to – at this point now, it's funny. Things kind of come full circle. And it's almost like uh, – Bobby Knight and Bob Huggins and uh, some of those kind of guys when we're talking about college basketball, Greg, right? They, there are these coaches that are so good that we think that they're like, uh, we hate them. And then they get older and we kind of find ourselves rooting for them. You know what I mean? No? 
just talking to myself. You you were done, Chad? Because I couldn't hear anything you were saying, but I think the audience was hearing you. So we're 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 back. You you back, Chad? Can you hear me? Or you yeah, I can me? hear you. I couldn't hear anything you were saying, but I think the audience could, because I can tell oh. now when the audience can hear and I can't. So oh, that's, good. that's all that matters. Ah. Um, let me ask you, I don't know if you, you mentioned this, but I was just looking over the sheets when you were talking about uh, the race. Um, the sheets look pretty good for Max Superfly. That's the one that I noticed, because Max Superfly, um, just comparing his, his sheets to the other horses, uh, seemed like uh, he was in a little bit better shape. And Everland also um, seemed to have good sheets. Uh, so, I don't know, did you talk about Maxi Superfly? Because... He went from a 24 to a 19 to a 13 this year, which is pretty good. While Everland, um, Everland did uh, two 14s this year. Look, they're both they're both trained by Eric Foster. Um, they have been races over the track, but I don't think they're good enough uh, against this field. I, okay. The two horses that I, I would point to, um, and they're one of them is going to be the high weight in in Alpine Princess. Um, I've loved this filly from day one. I love how she moves at Saratoga. Um, I thought she had an excuse last time out. I think she's better than she showed. I don't mind her on the poly track with her pedigree. Um, and the way that her action is, she's kind of low to the ground, very efficient mover. So I think Alpine Princess uh, will be tough. A and then the other horse that I think is interesting is, at a little bit of a price, is the eight horse in pink polka dots. This is a horse who's lightly raced just two from two. Uh, but done everything the right way. And uh, Joe Sharp ships in Joe Martorez, who uh, he, he's really tried to give a break to and rode a lot uh, this this winter at, Oak, at Fairground. So uh, pink polka dots at a little bit of a price for me, but I'm going to make my top selection Alpine Princess. All right. So you'll, you'll do like a 1-8 action in the 11th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now the 12th is the big one for Turfway, and that is the Jeff Ruby Stakes. And and, and so who, the winner, what, what did he do in the Derby last year? Finish second. Finish second. Finish second. Two fields. Yeah, two fields. And, and that was when uh, it really it bothered John to no end because he hates the poly track. And two fields came in with a crazy sheet number. I think he had this, the lowest sheet number of anybody in the Derby was in this <laughs> race uh, last year. And he didn't know what to do with it. And he was driving him bonkers and the horse ran second. And he didn't want to play the horse because it came over this track, even though on the sheets he was clearly the fastest horse in the Derby last year. <laughs> That's funny. Well, hey, you know, one race, anything can happen. We'll see if a trend is starting. Uh, we'll have to check it out, of course. Uh, first things first, and that's winning this race. So taking a look at the uh, odds, the morning line odds, endlessly, that's the favorite at 5-2. to two, And he's only been on uh, the synthetic once, but that was a 10. And on turf, he was running 14, 15, 13. Uh, so it is understandable when you compare him to the other horses in this field while endlessly is the favorite. He's a little bit of a diminutive horse. He's a small horse, but he's a, he's a cool horse. He, he 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 always runs a good race. He always puts himself in the right position. Umberto Rispoli has given him some great rides uh, so far in California. He's actually got a spot in the Preakness already, um, winning the race at Golden Gate last time. I, this is the first time he ships over, though, to Turfway. And <clears throat> for whatever reason, horses have struggled coming from California to run on this, on this poly track at Turfway. Hmm. Um, and for that reason, at five to two, I'm going to try and beat him. But I, I, I do think he's a nice horse. I, I think that the, the couple horses that interest me the most are going to be, um, the number three, lucky Jeremy. Uh, we, we mentioned him in passing before he was one of those Derby future wagers, uh, disappointed last time out in, in Sunland park in the Sunland park Derby running third, getting nailed on the wire for second. Um, he's back in the, on the East Coast at Turfway Park. Trainer Bill Moore a great job at Turfway. He's had a lot of success over there. Um, and he's a horse that I think can move forward on this poly track, um, especially being out of a war champ mare. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any uh, connotations of, of him struggling. And you're getting eight to one on, on Lucky Jeremy. So he's one that, that interests me quite a bit. Um, and then the other one at, at, at a little bit of a price is going to be the nine horse, uh, sees the gray. We talked about the last race, uh, the D Wayne Lucas horse in there. D Wayne Lucas brings the cult over in this race. And he's run a few races in the past that are, that put him in the thick of this. He's inconsistent as all be it. 
But in the in the world of March Madness, um, would it not be apropos that the coach wins one more uh, big prep race? Juarez and K. Nick Juarez. Nick Juarez. Nick Juarez. Oh, Nick Juarez. N I K. Okay, I was what the hell. Uh, by oh, by the way, that lucky Jeremy uh, started twenty one sixteen last year, hit a nine in his first race this year. So that was a seven point top predictably bounced to the 13 in his last race. So you would expect a forward move from lucky Jeremy, even though he hasn't been on synthetic, but then again, most of these horses haven't been on synthetic before. So, all right. So, um, and then any other horses in this field, Othello uh, is coming off a 15 and a 13, but again, not synthetic. Um, do you see anything else? Uh, wait, is that a nine I see out of a, a gate road? Okay, I gate road. But I gate road's going to be in the other race, right? What'd you say? I missed you there. Well, this is this is uh, since I can't hear you, uh, this is as good as time as any to uh, just uh, see if we can get your picks. Did you give your pick? You like Chucky Jeremy, right, Chad? Is that one of your picks? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So Pletcher Pletcher's going to run noted in this race, um, and he he's going to hope that he draws in uh, with the fourteen triplets wrestle. So obviously, there's going to be at least one scratch already. We know that a gate road's going to scratch. For Pletcher to come up here means that Pletcher has to think that there will at least be a second scratch in the race and he's going to get in the race. So I would assume a uh, triple espresso does get in the race. Okay. I didn't hear that. So I hope, uh, you gave your pick. Yeah, I'll go with, uh, I'll go with, uh, lucky Jeremy here to pull the upset, uh, with endlessly, uh, finishing second and sees the great third. All right. So again, I didn't hear that, but I'm assuming you gave your pick. So, all right, Chad, I'll let you go. I know you're real busy. Appreciate your time as always. Can't wait for next week, obviously, for your race. Um, and uh, all the big uh, prep races we'll be talking about. So uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, guys. All right. So, again, I hope everybody had an opportunity to hear Chad. I just could not. Um, but I believe you guys did hear him, and hopefully you heard his picks. If you didn't hear his picks, let me know. Put it in the comment section. And I will get Chad's picks and send them off to you. So that is going to wrap it up. Let me just go ahead and let everybody know uh, what we did once again. Chad, in the 11th race, a uh, turfway went 1-8. So uh, that's 1-8 uh, in um, the Bourbon Oaks. And then in the Jeff Ruby Stakes, Chad, I have no idea what he's going with. But I, I'm going to go with Max, that IMAX Superfly uh, in the 11th. And... I'm going with the three in the 12th, uh, Lucky Jeremy. And then just taking a look at what the boys did over at, well, what we all did over at Fairgrounds. In the 11th, John went with the one, Vivi's Dream over the five, six. Chad went with Intricate, uh, the six over the seven, our pretty woman. And then I went with the seven over the one, two. So I went with uh, our pretty woman. Over 1-2. And then the 12th, the Louisiana Derby. Uh, John and Chad both agreed with the 7, being Honor Marie. John went 5-9-11. So 7 with 5-9-11. Chad went 7-11. And then he also says he'll put a little bit on the 10. So 7-11 for Chad. I'm going to go and stick with Track Phantom. Uh, give him a shot here. And then I'm going to throw in the 7 and the 11. Uh, and, and, and if I get good odds... I was taking a look at if Hall of Fame somehow, like those odds go up, I might try to throw him into some action. And same thing with Catching Freedom. I don't think the odds are going to go up too much, if at all. But if if it did, then I'd be interested in, in, in Catching Freedom, the five horse, as well. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. A, a Gate Road is the intriguing one, of course. But um, unless a Gate Road's odds go up... I'll probably uh, do what everyone else is doing and stay away. Okay, so next week's going to be big. Can't wait. 
Uh, hope you guys uh, appreciate uh, everything John and uh, Chad have done uh, here on the channel because I know you do. And uh, can't wait for next week's show. Chad will be a couple days away from his uh, horse Clapton running uh, the big race there in Dubai. So that's going to be huge. And then we're going to have the huge Kentucky Derby prep races, including the Florida Derby, on next week's show. So don't forget to tune in right here on uh, our show and our YouTube channel, uh, of course, the Horsepower PSN. So thanks. We'll see you next time.